Hello, dear viewers. This is Kenito from Tokyo. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss uh, on the one of the most important uh, recent topics in AI ethics, that is algorithmic bias. I hope my talk will be a little bit beyond your expectations. Here we go. What does algorithmic bias mean today? This means social unfairness and inequality produced by AI. Timnit Gebru, a computer scientist, one of the leading researchers in this field, born in Ethiopia, and after studying at Stanford, she has worked on algorithmic bias, especially focusing on race and gender at Google. On 2020, she published a paper which showed the possible errors in a large-scale natural language AI system, the issues of energy consumption for the machine learning caused by the system, and the issues of environmental burdens it possibly brings. Over her publication, she eventually left from Google, and it became a scandal. But this is not the main interest of my talk today. My main interest lies in the fundamentals of AI ethics. Then, again, what is algorithm bias? Briefly speaking, the answer is AI would have prejudice. In human society, there exist various kinds of discrimination, hate, and wrong recognition. These social biases were embedded in AI as the forms of dataset, and AI itself imitates social bias and then starts to think with prejudice. This is called algorithmic bias. Such a potential problem had been pointed out already in the year 2012. Generally speaking, however, it's safe to say that it was at the Asiloma Conference on Artificial Intelligence in January 2017 that the AI problem of bias was widely recognized, noticed, and after that, the problem in question has become widely known all over the world. Here is an example of the AI bias problem I'm talking about. Suppose that there is a data set which shows the high rate of crime by social minority, for example, black people. An AI system which learns uh, such a bias data might show as its result a certain high potential rate of crime by black people. It's also well known that the facial distinction rate of the white male is much higher than that of black female people. I argue that unbalanced data will eventually give rise to this bias system, which was produced by insufficient quality and amount of data and the statistics. When such two slips meet at once, what will be happen? Let's suppose that a crime has occurred in some area. If AI let a conclusion of a potential suspect with much racial prejudice, moreover, if the potential suspect were specified by the AI facial system, which has its low distinction image recognition, what will be happened? False churches would be systematically made again and again based on such a biased AI crime analysis. This is a typical AI ethical problem of algorithmic bias. Most people easily think that an AI solution is worth trusting. But in reality, possibly, various fatal errors I'm talking about here are systematically produced by racial prejudice inherently kept in actual society and the low standard of maintaining database. And Timnit Gebru was one of the researchers who pointed out this problem, elucidated its mechanism and considered the possible solution for the problem. Her study in her research called Gender Shades showed a big difference between the precision of AI facial distinction of Caucasian male and that of black female. Also, she wrote her article under the category of Race and Gender in Oxford Handbook of AI Ethics 2020. This problem is called algorithmic bias, but the starting point of the problem lies in a dataset which includes prejudices. However, the present AI can distinguish the data issue from the algorithm issue, 
And for this reason, this particular problem is not so easy to be solved. TeamNIT emphasizes the importance of preserving the original data which gave rise to the algorithm and keeping it under the condition that re-examinations are possible. AI shouldn't copy or reproduce unconscious prejudice, discrimination and hate which lie in the societies we live in. Also, if distorted information were sent to our society with specific interests, our understanding would be influenced by that distorted information. For an example of this, the propaganda of Nazis German from 1933 to 45 is the worst ruinous example in the whole human history. Similarly, if big data, which reflect a specific interest, were taken in AI algorithm, the society would be manipulated with the abuse of AI calculation, AI calculation between quotation, as its result. How then can we prevent and overcome such an algorithmic error. Today, I'd like to propose a possible scenario of solutions for this difficult problem from the far eastern island country Japan. One of the key ideas I'd like to discuss can be found in Japanese Zen Buddhism, by which Steve Jobs got fascinated. Steve Jobs passed away in the year 2011 at the age of 56. So he knew neither Google Cat in 2012 nor the third wave AI boom after that. But if Steve were alive today during the pandemic of COVID-19, what kind of business and what kind of AI ethics would he be working on and promoting? There is a book titled Zen in the Art of Archery, which Steve Jobs loved to read throughout his life. Written in 1936 by a German philosopher, Eugen Herigel, born in 1884 and passed away in 1955. Originally in German, the Ritterliche Kunst der Bogenschließens von Eugen Herigel. This book explores the interaction between Japanese archery and the Japanese Zen praxis. During the 1920s, Dr. Hergel, who taught German idealism philosophy in a Japanese university, namely Tohoku Imperial University, learned ancient Japanese archery, or Kyudo, not Judo, but Kyudo, with a grandmaster Kenzo Awa, Awa Kenzo. The word kudo literally means uh, the way of archery. From the standpoint of European rational swords, archery is originally used as a weapon which hits its target. And now it has become one of the popular sports. But in Japan, still until the end of the 20th century, Zen priests practiced shooting a bow at the means of prayer, prayer. For Japanese people, archery has been regarded as something quite spiritual. In this regard, let me briefly talk about Zen and Buddhism, but in order to do this, here I'd like to introduce Dr. Reverend Masaki Matsubara. He's a Zen priest and also he's working as Cornell University, Brown University, and also our University of Tokyo as a visiting professor. Furthermore, he was served as a mindfulness mentor at Google, the company, who also introduced G-Pose stress reduction system there. Life is suffering. We are living in a tough daily life. Our life is tough. That is a Buddhist idea to think about. In other words, how it is possible to understand Life is Dukkha. That is the, the core idea of in Buddhism. For example, Buddhism gives us a solution. The solution is called the concept of four noble truths. Four noble truths. One is obviously there is suffering. Second, that suffering 
has a cause. Third, there is a liberation from the suffering that is called nirvana. Number four, which is last, is that there is a way to achieve the liberation, nirvana. Look at an image of Requiem shot by a priest. This archery place was established in the year 1977 by Reverend Kohun Suhara, the abbot of Keisho An Temple, located as one of the sub temple of the main temple called Engakuji in Kamakura. By the way, Engakuji Temple is the place where Dr. Matsuburo was born. The bow Dr. Herigel used is now stored in this archery place at Engakuji. The great master Awa taught to Dr. Herigel, in the context of Japanese archery, shooting a bow not in technique, but in spirit. In other words, the great master taught to the doctor, don't think and don't aim the target. But why does Japanese archery teach not to think and not aim at the target.